a welcome to you, uh, those who are present in the building and those out there in uh, computer land. Um, what a blessing it is uh, for the saints to gather together. And we also welcome uh, visitors, uh, seekers. Um, we just pray, Lord, that uh, uh, this is a blessing to you and that it uh, draws you into fellowship with, with Christ. Um, this morning, I'd like to uh, invite up uh, some um, of the ministries here for a ministry fair. Um, Britt and Sherilyn and Jennifer, why don't you guys come on up? I'll start. Hi, I'm Sherry Lynn, and I am with Youth Ministry here. Um, my husband and I um, are running Youth Ministry, and you probably all know who Darren is already. Um, and we will be starting up Youth Group next Tuesday, the 28th, for middle school and high school, and we're really looking forward to that. Had a great time at camp in August, and uh, really looking forward to starting up Youth Group again. And today, we will be in the back, um, and you can come and chat with us if you're interested in hanging out with our youth. And we also have access to a really great um, online, kind of a learning venue, it's called Access, Access to Access, and uh, just a really great opportunity for parents to learn about how to communicate with their youth, and it talks about mental health and parenting and just the culture that we're in. So uh, I encourage you to stop by and chat at, at the end of the service. Okay, thanks. Good morning. I'm Jennifer, and today I'm going to talk briefly about our mom-to-mom -mom ministry and what that is. Um, I've been a part of mom-to-mom -mom for about five or six years, and it is a wonderful group. It's uh, a social group. We meet about six or seven times a year to fellowship, have a meal together. Uh, we do crafts sometimes. We sometimes play games. It's, it's just a fun group of ladies, and anyone is welcome. Anyone who is a mom, that uh, brand new moms, maybe first-time moms, all the way up to great-grandmothers are welcome to come and join us. Uh, Jenny Forberg is our leader and our organizer, and she's going to be at the table in the back if you have any questions or would like to get more information. Good morning, everybody. I'm Britt Hemphill, family pastor, representing Children's Ministries this morning. So the kids that I'm talking to you about would be babies through grade five. Uh, obviously, Sunday morning, really important for serving those kids and their parents and families. So that's a main kind of a front and center thing. Always mindful of ways to also support parents in the parenting journey. Um, and uh, yeah, always looking for people that are inspired to be around the little people of our church. So if you have interest in learning more about that, I'm going to be at the table briefly after service. There are some books there for parents that are free. If you see something you like, go ahead and take it. And um, yeah, we'd love to talk to you more if you have a sense of God inviting you to serve our kids. Thanks. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is uh, to come together. Uh, what a blessing it is to be held in your hands, to be a part of your family. Uh, we have been uh, so blessed in so many ways, and, and yet often we uh, lose sight of that. Lord, help us to focus on you, to turn our eyes to you, to uh, uh, truly understand just how much uh, that you've given. We pray, Lord, uh, today, uh, you help us to walk in faith, not by sight. Help us uh, to... Uh, live as uh, your representatives here on earth, uh, to uh, speak the truth in love, um, to be disciples and to, to learn all we can about you. We praise you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Announcements. Good morning, and welcome to Dungeness Community Church. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new to DCC, we would love to get to know you better. There are several ways to get connected. Stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby, fill out a welcome card located on one of our offering boxes in the back of the auditorium, text the word hello to the number on the screen, or click the Connect button on our website. As we transition into fall, we will continue to have one worship service at 10 a.m. 
The chapel is available as an overflow space and is open for anyone who would prefer a less crowded space to view the service on the big screen. In addition, the Sunday service is now live streaming on YouTube. Join us at home or on the go. The service will be available on live stream beginning at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Youth group is returning on Tuesday evenings at the church beginning September 28th. Middle schoolers will meet from 6 to 7.30 p.m., followed by the high school from 7.45 to 9.15. Contact Sherry Lynn Sweeney with any questions. Right now, Media Marriage Night is Friday, September 24th. This will be an evening to laugh, learn, and grow in your marriage from the comfort of your own home. A Right Now Media login is required for the $20 ticket purchase. For help with a login or registration, contact the church office. Living Water will be holding a meeting next Thursday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. in the chapel. Julie Hill, the Living Water representative, will be here to share information about this incredibly impactful ministry. Families of kids up to grade five, it's peanut butter and jelly time. Since the first lunch was so popular, we're meeting again for a peanut butter and jelly lunch after church next Sunday in the chapel. Please join us. Coming soon, we will have the sermon series available on podcast. Watch for more information about this new feature. And now, let's join our worship team as we lift our voices together in praise to our Lord. I want you to stand up with us and, and feel free to clap, stomp your feet. Let's uh, sing our praises out to the Lord. Lover of 
shepherd is never failing ruler of my heart everlasting lover of my soul on the mountain high or in the valley low the king of love my shepherd So through all the length of days Thy goodness faileth never Good shepherd, may I sing your praise Within your house forever Within your house forever is running after is running after me your goodness is running after is running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after is running after me So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God tree 
his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all our captain for now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given with shield of faith and belt of truth we stand against the devil's lies and army bold whose battle cry is love Reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the soul that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died. 
Precious promise of one day standing with you, one day going home to be with you. Until that time, Lord, help us to stand firm in our faith, to stand on that solid rock that can't be moved. Jesus Christ, our Lord, we praise you, Lord, that you have given us truth, though so often we don't understand. But we pray, Lord, that you give us clear minds, give us pure hearts your righteousness. We praise you, Lord, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, DCC kids, Pastor Britt here to introduce today's Go lesson. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. They sold him into slavery he was then accused of a crime he didn't commit and was abandoned and forgotten in prison for years. But God rescued him from prison and raised him up as a great leader, bringing him face to face with his brothers who had betrayed him. They didn't even recognize him. Joseph could have held his brothers' sin against them, but he didn't. Instead, he forgave them. Today's Bible account is Joseph and his brothers. And the big idea is God is forgiving so we can forgive others. The memory verse is, Be kind and tender to one another. Forgive each other just as God forgave you because of what Christ has done. It's Ephesians 4 verse 32. Forgiveness is hard. It means giving up our desire to get even with those who hurt us or make us feel bad. It means giving up our desire for revenge. But when we remember all that God has forgiven us through Jesus, we have everything we need to be able to forgive others. I don't know who you need to forgive this week, but I hope you'll extend them that gift. Whether you're at home or in the building, I hope you enjoy today's lesson. Have a great Sunday because of Jesus. All right, and our kids are dismissed to their classes. And uh, I want to do a couple of uh, housekeeping things here before we get started. Uh, first, I want to extend a greeting to everyone who is watching at home live this morning. Uh, this is a, a change because for the last year and a half, I've been pre-recording the sermons for folks that are online. And so they've just seen me talking to a camera alone in the studio. Well, I'm not alone. Shane is there, but we're almost alone. So uh, it's nice to have you guys joining us this morning live. And uh, great to have all of you here in person as well. A um, couple, couple little business things I want to do. First, uh, I want to take a minute to pray for our Mexico team. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if this got mentioned, but um, we got a message this morning that the Mexico team is on their way back. They're about six hours south of here, down near Eugene, and they burned up a bearing on the trailer. So, there's not a lot of trailer service places open on Sundays. Uh, they are trying to get something lined up today, but if not, they may be staying overnight to get this repaired tomorrow. And uh, so, why don't we just take a moment and pray for those guys and just how that gets resolved. 
Father, I just thank you so much for the great week that team has had. Uh, you know there have been challenges this week, and yet they've had such a wonderful time. And I thank you for this, uh, just this dear woman, uh, older saint who loves you, who now has a home to live in. And it was so thrilled, Father. We just thank you for that, for your blessing on her. I pray for our team now as they are trying to get home, hopefully today. Uh, Lord, you know the parts they need, you know the people they need to get it serviced, and we just would ask that you would bring all those things together, and that if possible, Father, our prayer is they could get home today. So we would ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, one other item of business, and that is, uh, I think all of you should have gotten the email this week uh, talking about some changes we're doing staff-wise, some changing positions and stuff, and one of those changes was that Sean Stanton has made the decision he's going to step out of the adult ministries role, uh, pursue some other stuff, uh, still part of DCC, still going to be overseeing our DC campus project for us, but he's stepping out of that one phase of ministry. And Sean, you thought you might get away with just a video, and that's just not going to happen. So, Burnett, if you'll give me this and you up here, Okay, I won't, I won't make you say anything, but it'd be really weird if you didn't. I'm going to turn around, Don't you? I do. Yeah. What do you want? What, what do you want to say? Gift. Your gift. Okay, so I've been here on staff for almost five years, and it's been amazing. I mean, I made the best friends I've ever had in my entire life. I've seen God in more ways than I had imagined that he was. Um, I love you guys, all of you, some of you I've had amazing relationships, some of you I've watched from the side. Um, the relationship I have with Tim has been incredible and, and uh, I can't say how thankful I am for the opportunity to be here and to have served all of you. And I, and I hope going forward, you see me the same way as somebody that would definitely walk alongside you and, and encourage you and be there for you. Um, I've been in some form of leadership since I was in my 20s, and that's kind of just the reason I'm walking away. It's just uh, time for less leadership. I mean, I'll still lead Tim, um, <laughs> but other than that, that's, and that's a full-time job that I'm not getting paid for. But uh, anyway, thank you for my wife, Becky, who has been so amazing through these years and told me I could do something I never thought I could. So anyway, thank you, and thank you for the gift. You are welcome. Not bad for impromptu. Yeah. There you go. I love that. All right, man. <laughs> Thank you. All right. How about a sermon? <laughs> I, uh, years ago, I had a chance to spend a week up in the islands north of Campbell River, British Columbia with some guys. We were out on this sailboat for about a week. It was absolutely wonderful. We did a ton of fishing. And uh, there was a little skiff we pulled along with us. And so my buddy Greg and I, uh, every day, would get on that skiff and go out and explore around the islands. And we fished a lot. I mean, a lot. And, uh, and one of the days, as we were out fishing, we um, were pretty close to shore, and we saw this black bear, um, this mama bear and her cub coming down toward the water. And uh, I had my camera with me in the boat, and we had been uh, trolling a little bit, and so I cut the engine and uh, started taking pictures. I had a telephoto lens on, so I'm in the camera there. I'm taking pictures. And um, you know, when you're taking pictures, you, you kind of lose perspective on, on fully where you're at. And, and I'm taking pictures, and I suddenly hear Greg from the front of the boat going, Tim, Tim, that's close enough. <laughs> and I, I let the camera down, and of course, the boat was pointed toward the, the shore, right? And Greg is in the bow. Well, the bow of the boat is just about to bump into a rock <laughs> that's just below where the bear is standing. And uh, Greg seemed to feel that I was done taking pictures at that point. Now, if you spend any time in boats, you'll know that drifting is a constant issue. There, there are always tides and currents from below that are pushing you around. There's always wind and weather from above that is trying to drive you off course. And, and so drifting is always something you have to pay attention to when you're in a boat. 
Um, and, and the thing about drifting is it's very gentle. And, and it's usually quite silent. It, it doesn't make a lot of commotion. It just gradually moves you farther and farther away from where you intended to go or maybe closer and closer to the bear, as the case may be. And all you really have to do is just let the environment take control. Just stop paying attention. When it comes to spirituality, it, it seems that we live in a time when there is a lot of drifting. Uh, Pew Research, several years ago, coined a term that they called the nuns. And it was to describe those who don't identify with any religious affiliation. No, not necessarily atheistic, they just are nothing. They're the nuns. According to their 20, to 2021 survey, 18% of Americans identify themselves religiously as nothing in particular. The 2015 survey reported about 7% that reported that said that they were nothing in particular, but they also said that for them religion was very, or at least somewhat, important in their lives. So it's very important, but I'm nothing in particular. I don't know if you could find a better description of spiritual drifting than being nothing in particular. So many currents pull at people within our culture, don't they? Uh, there is science specifically a kind of science we might call scientific materialism, the idea that physical cause and effect can serve as an adequate explanation for absolutely everything from the dawn of the universe to the experience of human personality, that it all can be explained with just material processes. Or alternate religions that promise new and exciting ways to find spiritual power and fulfillment uh, maybe that's Eastern mysticism, or Wiccan practice, or even psychedelics. Uh, Burnett and I were watching a movie a couple weeks ago. It's supposed to be, we thought, about the life cycle of mushrooms. <laughs> that's not where the movie went. And, um, but according to these guys, the, the way to unlock your greatest spiritual potential was via psychedelic mushrooms. And so all kinds of things out there vying for our attention. Add to that the religion of politics. And you find people that passionately pour their energies into politics in the hopes that it may unlock the keys to make our world a kinder and a gentler place. And then, you know, there's the mind-numbing torrent of distracting media. You can swipe and tweet and Facebook and, until the cows come home uh, and be totally consumed with that media. And so is it any wonder that many people caught in all of those currents of our culture, when you ask them what role does religion, does faith play in their lives, they come away and say, well, it's nothing in particular. I'm just going to let the tide be my guide and I'll go wherever it pushes me. Those kind of strong currents are nothing new. Uh, things that would draw followers of Jesus away from following him are nothing new. In fact, you're going to see as we get into this book of Hebrews that one of the overarching concerns of the author is people drifting. Last week, we looked at the first chapter of this book, and it was this magnificent depiction of Christ as being the creator and the sustainer of all things, the exact imprint and the radiating glory of God the Father, the one with authority over all angels, the most powerful heavenly beings we know of, he is far superior to them. In chapter 2, the writer is going to continue building on that theme, but he starts with a little aside in the first four verses. We're not going to go over every verse in this chapter, but let me just take you to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Therefore, considering Christ who is superior above all, in light of who he is, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. What should we do in light of who Jesus is? He says, we should pay much closer attention. Pay close attention to Jesus. 
that phrase that is translated there is really two Greek words. The, the first one means more super abundantly. And the second one means that we are holding something firmly in our mind. Now, if you had followed me into the grocery store a couple of weeks ago, uh, you would have heard me muttering under my mask, a lemon, a lime, and creamer. A lemon, a lime, and creamer. A lemon, a lime, and creamer. And that's because my wife had asked me to go to the store for her, and she asked me to get a lemon, a lime, and some creamer. But I know myself, and I can be easily distracted. <laughs> and if I did not keep a lemon, a lime, and creamer held firmly in my mind, she was going to at best get two out of three. <laughs> That's the idea of holding something firmly in mind. In fact, that Greek word can actually refer to bringing a boat up onto land, in other words, beaching it. Dr. Timothy Keller translates it as, be furiously obsessed. So why do we need to be super abundantly, firmly holding the majesty of Jesus in our minds? Why should we run our thoughts aground on that truth and be furiously obsessed with it? Well, the writer says, because if we don't, we may find ourselves drifting. And as my buddy Greg would affirm, drifting can get you into trouble. Here's what Hebrews 2, 2 and 3 says. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, he picks up again, which we saw in chapter 1, this theme of angels. And, and the Old Testament in several places talks about angels being God's messengers and passing on uh, his laws and his revelations to human agents. Uh, the story of the Old Testament also is the story of people over and over again disobeying God and then facing the consequences. And the argument here is that if people found themselves on God's wrong side for not listening to the message of angels, how do you think it's going to turn out if we refuse to listen to the one who is far above any angel? What hope is left if you ignore the one who isn't simply carrying a message from the king, but who in fact is the king himself? Remember how Hebrews 1.3 described Jesus? It said, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So maybe you're one of those that would label yourself as nothing in particular. It's a comfortable place to be. There's not a lot of effort involved in that. But, but imagine that you're out on a, an air mattress on, on a warm sunny day just floating on the balmy seas. It's a beautiful day, it's just fun to float and just let things push you where they go. But, but imagine as you're out there floating, someone came up alongside you in a boat and they said, hey, do you see that, that lighthouse and that point of land right there, the one you're coming up on? That is the last point of land before you're going to be adrift on the high seas. And, and the currents don't come back this way. You, you are about to lose all contact with your only hope. Now, no matter how sunny the day or how comfortable the air mattress, wisdom would dictate that you should at least paddle over and check it out for yourself. Is that really the place where I need to beach myself? And if it is, if that really is the lighthouse, then you'd better quit floating and start beaching. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying here is our hope. Christ is the one. Don't just drift around. He is the one to beach yourself on. There's an interesting bit of historical testimony in verses 3 and 4. The writer says that uh, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. So he points to this message and says the one who first talked about this was none other than Jesus himself. And then he goes on and he says that it was attested to us by those who heard. 
which, which indicates some of these internal clues as far as who the writer of Hebrews is. This is one of the things that indicates that this author had not personally heard Jesus teach in his earthly ministry. All right, so whether you think it's Paul or someone else was the author, it was someone who had not personally heard Jesus teach, but he knew people who had. He knew firsthand witnesses, and he says to the people he's writing to, he says, you know these people as well. In fact, he knows that they know them so well, they have such easy access to them, that he doesn't even bother to name who it is because they all know. Everybody had heard them. They had talked to them. They knew people, first generation, who had walked with Jesus. And then finally, he points to an evidence that is frequently cited by other New Testament writers. He says, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. And here is one of those places you get an echo of some of Paul's thought. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And then he goes on in that chapter to list a, a whole variety of giftings, including things like gifts of teaching, gifts of wisdom, and, and on up to more dramatic things, what we might call the sign gifts, like healing and, uh, and manif in fact, he talks about a gift of miracles, uh, things that were physical manifestations of God's presence and power. And then Paul concludes this in 1 Corinthians, down in verse 11. He says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Again, like Hebrews talks about, God bore witness by various gifts of the Holy Spirit that were distributed according to his will. And so Paul says the same. So the writer Hebrews says that not only had these people heard about Jesus and what he had done from eyewitnesses who were still living and to whom they had easy access, he says, you've also seen and experienced things that aren't explainable by any other means than God did it. Those miracles and those signs had all been connected with the message of Jesus. They kept validating what they had heard Jesus taught. He says, uh, for those drifters, don't forget, you have seen things that you cannot unsee. The message of Jesus has this element of experiential validation. And it's a great reminder to me that our faith is rooted in historical events. A real man taught and did amazing things that culminated in his death and then his resurrection. And real people heard and saw him, both in his teaching and they saw him after his resurrection. And those real people shared their real experiences with other real people. And those people, too, experienced things that validated physically the proclamation that God was profoundly at work spiritually. It's also a reminder to me that while God can and does do miraculous things, it's never the signs that are the focus. In fact, a sign is only significant because it points to something greater. Right? You, you never, uh, yesterday we took a hike out on the uh, Spruce Railroad Trail by Lake Crescent, and on the way out there was a sign pointing us to the Spruce Railroad Trail. We actually did not stop and spend our day at the sign. Okay? That wasn't the point of going out there. The sign was to point us to the trail. And so the signs were to point these people to something greater, which was Jesus himself. So the writer of Hebrews doesn't spend any time recounting the sensational details of signs. What is sensational is the one that the signs point to. They point to Jesus. And the point of Hebrews is that Jesus is better. So the train of thought that was started in chapter 1 now resumes at verse 5 of Hebrews 2. It says, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. So once again, there's this declaration that Jesus is superior to any angelic being. But then in verse 8, he declares this. He says, Now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside of his control. 
everything, he says, is under the authority of Jesus. But that brings up a, a pretty natural question, at least it does for me. One of the reasons that some of these people were drifting was because they were hurting. They were facing persecution, they were facing challenges, they were facing arguments, that it was tempting them to drift. And the question that I think comes up is, if Jesus really is over all, if it's all under his authority, then why am I still going through hard times? Or as Philip Yancey once titled a book, Where is God When It Hurts? Part of the answer comes in Hebrews 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him. He says, there is a, there is a reality of all things being subjection under Jesus that we don't yet fully see. That the battle is not finished. And yet, in the midst of it, we see him. The story of the Bible is constantly talking about two aspects. There is the now and the not yet. And in the now, we live in this world that is marred by sin. God has already begun a work of a new creation and redemption in the lives of his children. But this is not all. And as God's children, we look forward to the day when all things are made new. That is the not yet. And the reason we have hope for the not yet is not just because we are some kind of, um, well, the glass is half full kind of people. The promise of the not yet, which we have not seen, is grounded in the reality of Jesus, the one who has been seen and whose power continues to transform lives. You know, maybe, maybe your faith is drifting a bit right now. And just reading the words of an ancient writer, divinely inspired though he might be, just doesn't make things seem real enough. Let me give you a little practical advice from my own journey. I've talked about this over the years. For some of you, maybe you haven't heard it before, but I was six years into my role as a pastor when I went through an intense crisis of faith, and I doubted everything there was to doubt about God. And it wasn't because I didn't have a lot of Bible knowledge. I, I, had, I had gone to four years of Bible college. I'd gone to three years of seminary. I had a bachelor's and a master's degree. I had lots of Bible knowledge. And, and as God rebuilt my faith, that knowledge was super helpful. And, and science and philosophy played a role too. Science speaks volumes to the reality of God. Philosophically, there are solid reasons to hold to the fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that his way is the best way to go. But I have to be honest that in my dark night of the soul, sometimes just reading great words and pondering great thoughts didn't touch me. Because the question comes, okay, those are great words, those are great thoughts, but is it really true? I mean, does it really make a difference that all things are under Christ, honestly? Or is this just another set of nice ideas? And, and maybe I could join those people that say I'm just nothing in particular. I have a whole array of interesting ideas and nice quotes from various teachers and sources, but why should I center on Jesus? What difference does it really make? And the pain and the doubts in my heart and mind at times drowned out the ancient voices of the Bible and the contributions of great thinkers. But something that helped me in those moments to see again the power and the presence of Jesus were the personal stories of people who had been far from God and who had been drawn to him in powerful and sometimes supernatural ways. Because it was this physical reminder that God is at work. He's not just a great idea. He is a great power. And he is a power that is powerfully at work. And I'm not alone. 
Nick Ripken is a missionary who has spent time in some of the darkest and most pain-filled corners of our world. And Nick relates how the pain and the suffering and the evil he had witnessed began to just wear down his spirit. And as he began to interview believers, though, in some of the most persecuted, darkest places, they began to help renew his faith. Here's how he described it. He said, after witnessing the horror of so much evil in Somalia, I had sometimes wondered if God actually understood the true nature of human pain today. I wondered if the Bible stories that I loved were only history. I was desperate to be sure that he was not just a past tense God who lived and acted there and then, but that he is still showing his power and his love here and now. The stories that I was hearing saved my life. God is indeed still present in this broken world. He is working. He is doing what he has always done. And through the stories, my hope and my faith were being rekindled. The writer of Hebrews reminds these people, you've seen the evidence of God's power at work to change lives. Let me recount briefly just one of Nick's stories. I think it's one I've shared in the past, but to me it is such a beautiful reminder of this. Nick at one point had planned a trip where he was going and interviewing people from various regions all around the world, people living under persecution. And as he was preparing for the trip, he got a message from a doctor, got an email, this doctor asking if he would please come to his country because he wanted to meet with him. Nick already had his schedule set. He said, I'm sorry, I just can't do it on this trip. But over the next two months, this doctor kept contacting Nick, kept asking him to come, and Nick kept saying, I'm sorry, I can't do it. But as the trip progressed, there kept being these unexpected changes and cancellations. And suddenly, Nick comes to a place where he realizes he's got this open slot with nothing planned. And once again, this doctor sends him a message saying, would you please come and meet with me? And, and finally, after praying about it, Nick decided, yes, he would go and meet with this doctor. So the meeting place was going to be this tiny, remote airport. And, uh, and so Nick flew in, and as he got off the plane, he spotted the gentleman that he was sure was this doctor that he was supposed to meet with. And uh, along with this doctor, there were several men, about five men, in traditional Muslim dress standing right behind the doctor. So Nick went to the doctor, and he asked who his friends were. Who are, the, who are these men? And uh, let me just read you the doctor's response. He says, well, Dr. Ripken, if you don't know these men and I don't know these men, then we have a serious security problem. <laughs> they told me they had come to meet you. So I'm going to have to leave you now. Here's my cell phone number. If everything turns out all right, call me, and I'll come back and get you. <laughs> and with that, Nick was left alone with five men he did not know at a small deserted airport. Well, as things played out, these men invited Nick to follow them because they wanted to talk to him. And Nick sensed that God was in it, and so he took the risk and he followed them. And they took him to a small private room, and when they sat down in silence, they all looked at Nick, waiting for him to say something. He wasn't sure what he was supposed to say, so he finally gave this little rundown of what had brought him there and how he was going around interviewing Christians in persecuted regions and learning their stories and trying to encourage them. And uh, one of the men spoke English and translated, and as he did, uh, all the men began to laugh because Nick had told him, he said, I'm really not sure why I'm here. And the translator explained, he said, you may think you know why you've come here, but we would like to tell you why you are here. All of them were very new believers in Jesus. Each had come to faith independently and in miraculous ways. One of them had dreamed a dream about a blue book. And in his dream, a voice had said, look for this book, read this Bible. Now, he didn't know what that meant, but when he woke up, he was just obsessed with what this dream meant and began searching for this blue book, this Bible. Well, of course, in this very strict Muslim country, that was hard to find. There wasn't one around, but after a long period of searching, he walked into a Quranic bookstore, and the shelves were lined with green books. But in the back, on a bottom shelf, there was one blue book. 
And when he pulled it out, it was a Bible, and it was a Bible in his dialect. He took the Bible home, he read it through five times, and became a follower of Jesus. Well, another one shared his story. Uh, he had, too, had a dream about finding Jesus, but he didn't know where or how to look. And one day, he was in a crowd, and a man he had never met approached him, and he said, the Holy Spirit told me to give you this book. And he handed him a Bible. He took it home. He read it three times, and he became a follower of Jesus. And as they went around, each of these five men had a similar story. But each of them, as they had come to faith in Christ, had also faced intense persecution for that commitment to Jesus. And as far as they knew, they were the only believers in their community. But God had worked that these five men found each other, and they formed this little fellowship. And they would meet late at night to sing quietly and read their scriptures and encourage each other, but they really didn't know much. And so they told Nick that two months earlier, they had started to pray. And here's what they prayed said, oh God, we don't know how to do this. You ever pray one of those prayers? We grew up and were trained as Muslims. We know how to be Muslims in a Muslim environment. We even know how to be communists in a Muslim environment. But we do not know how to follow Jesus in a Muslim environment. Please, Lord, send us someone who can encourage and teach us. And they prayed that prayer for two months. Do you recall how long... Nick had been on his trip about two months. They said that finally that very morning, at 1.30 in the morning, as they were praying, the Holy Spirit had told them to go to the airport and talk to the first white man that got off the airplane and that he be the man that God was sending to answer their questions. And so the men said to Nick, that is why you are here. And if you want to read more of Nick's story, I'd really recommend this book, The Insanity of God. But, but it's an encouragement. It says God is at work. Even we, see, we hear about the terrible things happening in Afghanistan. You can, you can feel like, well, what hope is there? I just want to remind you, God is at work. Someone reminded me this week that Afghanistan right now is, is making contracts with China to send in thousands and thousands of workers from China into Afghanistan. Do you want to know where the largest, most active, growing home church movement is? It's in China. You know, just when we think that, oh, well, God must have lost, God hasn't lost. God is active. And the writer of Hebrews reminds those he writes to who are tempted to drift that the stories they knew that pointed undeniably to the active work of a powerful God should remind them to stand fast. Now, while I'm talking about those sorts of stories, let me be clear that I'm not saying that our faith should be based or focused on seeking supernatural signs. Uh, that misemphasis can and does get people into all sorts of craziness and error. Uh, last week, I talked about my Alaska fishing trip and how I was on this river and to my untrained eye, I couldn't see any fish and yet my guide could and, and sure enough, fish were there. Um, and I use it as a metaphor to help explain how New Testament writers often see Jesus in the Old Testament in ways that we may miss. I want to pick up that metaphor again and talk about this issue of signs. Because there was something on that river which even to my untrained eye convinced me that there were fish in this river. And that was every now and then there was a splash. Something jumped. Something caught my attention and said, there is more going on here than you may realize. Now, here's the problem. If I became focused simply on wanting to see fish jump, I wouldn't be fishing. I wouldn't gain anything out of the river. That would be a very shallow way, literally, to approach a river. Because those flashes weren't really where the action was at. In fact, those flashes didn't tell me very much about the river. They didn't tell me very much about the fish. That was open to all kinds of interpretation and misinterpretation. But sometimes those splashes are an encouragement to a doubting fisherman that there really is something alive in the river and that this is a place you should keep fishing. It's interesting, Jesus used some splashes to encourage none other than John the Baptist. Remember John when he was in prison and he actually sent some of his followers to Jesus to say, are you really the one or 
Are we looking for someone else? Because you're not doing things the way I thought you would. For one thing, I didn't think that following you was going to mean I was going to be in prison. And yet here I am. And here's what Jesus said. He said, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended or who does not fall away on account of me. The signs were not the thing John was to put his faith in. The only thing the signs did was they validated that he was putting his faith in the right one. Don't drift to another fishing hole. Don't switch streams. Hold tight to Jesus. Hebrews 2, 8 and 9. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him. Here's the other thing this pastor reminds us of when it comes to the wounds and failures of our hearts and lives, and that is that Jesus, who is above all, is also beside us. Hebrews 2.10, it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Well, what does that mean? That Jesus is made perfect through suffering. How, how could Jesus, the perfect one, the superior one, be made any more perfect? What does he mean by that? He talks about him being the founder of our salvation. It can also be translated as the pioneer, the trailblazer, the point man in the battle. He's the one who has cleared the way and given us an example to follow after. And while there have been a lot of theological treatises on what it means that Jesus was made perfect through suffering, here's how I've come to understand it. His suffering made him the perfect one for us to follow. Jesus didn't set the course for us from somewhere far away or detached from the blood, sweat, and tears of life in a fallen world. He didn't guide us like uh, maybe you hear stories about those drone pilots, you know, that are waging a war sitting in an air-conditioned cubicle somewhere in Colorado while the war is going on, you know, oceans away and they're simply watching it on a screen. I mean, Jesus could have done that, and he still would have been perfect in who he was, right? He was perfect. And the way that he would have marked out for us, if he had done that, would have been a perfect way to go. He would not have sent us on a bad trail. But he wouldn't have been anyone for us grunts in the trenches to have been able to relate to and trust in following him. How can you trust a leader in crisis if that leader has never faced crisis? Jesus was perfect from all eternity, but by humbling himself to walk among us, by allowing himself to experience as a man the realities of temptation, by allowing himself to feel the emotional toll of rejection and betrayal, by subjecting himself to the physical limitations and suffering of a body all the way to the ultimate suffering of death on a cross, he became another kind of perfect. The perfect one for us to follow through this jungle of a broken world. The perfect one to look to not only for direction but also for example. We do not yet see everything in subjection to him but we see him, and we know that he sees, and he understands, and he loves us perfectly. In fact, I want to draw our attention to one more way that Jesus is better, another way that he is perfect for us. Verses 17 and 18. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is also able to help those who are being tempted. You know what temptation really is? Temptation is simply the option that we face to choose a different path than the one God is calling us to. It's looking for a shortcut to happiness trying to come up with our own way. And, that's, and usually that way allows us to get around something difficult, or at least we think it will. 
It allows us to avoid pain. It allows us to avoid sacrifice. That's, that's what makes the temptation so tempting. This trail looks a lot easier than that trail. Hebrews tells us that in Jesus, God chose to put himself in a position where he could feel the temptation to choose the easy way rather than the obedient way. And it says he didn't feel that temptation just a little. This was not a Costco sample of temptation. You know, I like those. I never actually buy the thing. I just try a little bit out. He says, no, Jesus didn't just get a sample. He suffered. He suffered when tempted. Jesus faced temptations in ways that were deeply painful to his mind and his heart. The struggle was real, and I think the specific struggle in view here is that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus was most profoundly tempted to turn aside from the Father's will. And think about these Hebrew Christians, the temptation that they're facing. They're facing persecution. The temptation is, you know, if we just back off of this Jesus thing a little bit, maybe the persecution will go away. We could just drift off a ways and we could avoid this pain. And, and the author reminds us here that Jesus faced that temptation too. He sweats, as it were, drops of blood because of the pain and the struggle and saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, couldn't the cup have passed from him? It wouldn't have been hard, right? All he had to do was walk out of that garden and walk out of Jerusalem and just agree that, hey, guys, I won't talk about this stuff anymore. I'm not going to go to that cross. I, I just, I'm just not going to do it. That was completely in Jesus' power. And Jesus, the man, understood that it was right there in front of him that he could walk away. And yet he chose to be obedient. I guess the question I'd ask you is, is there something painful, something self-sacrificing that God has called you to? And you look at it and you think, God, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to stay on this path. I know it's the path you've given me, but I don't want to go there. And the temptation is right there to just drift off to the side and not do it. And the reminder here is that Jesus understands. He understands that temptation. He knows what that suffering feels like to choose to be obedient, even when it'd be so easy to walk away. People who have consistently proven themselves to be failures at true love deserve to be finally and ultimately excluded from the circle of God's love. That's the penalty of death. And yet, Jesus, who loved perfectly and obeyed perfectly, died. And the scriptures say that he died for me. In a mysterious way, he opened this door that I was totally unable to open on myself. He paid the penalty that I deserve. That's what that fancy word propitiation means. It means that Jesus made a way for God's wrath to be averted from me and in his place to receive the gift of life and grace. He didn't just experience what temptation feels like. He didn't just open the door to heaven. Hebrews tells me that he became a merciful and faithful high priest who is able to help those who are being tempted. Right here in the here and now to be actively engaged. Jesus, the radiance of God, the exact imprint of God's nature, has also become our brother. A, a kind-hearted, sympathetic, actively engaged representative and defender of people like us. A merciful friend of sinners like you and me. One who has walked where we walk, one who understands what we struggle with, and one who in love is willing to help us. So are you discouraged? Has your faith been drifting? I want to encourage you to take to heart the opening words of this chapter. Pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Super abundantly 
firmly hold to the majesty of Jesus in your mind. Be furiously obsessed with him because his love has been furiously poured out over us. Amen? Jesus is better. Let me get that on. There we go. Yeah, Scripture tells us that uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. We're not to have faith in faith or faith in works or faith in uh, material things. Uh, our faith is to be in a person, in the person of Jesus Christ. Just stand up and let's uh, sing, praise him again. <laughs>
Death has lost its grip on me For you have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Jesus Christ, my living hope Oh God, you are my you, Lord. We thank you. And we love you. And Lord, have your way in us and through us, day by day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.